Uh, good morning, Mike. Uh, <laughs> Dave. Uh, this is uh, October 17th. Um, we're at the San Diego Marriott at the uh, 2010 uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists Annual Meeting. And I have the uh, distinction and honor uh, and joy of interviewing you here for the Wood Library Museum uh, Living History uh, interview. Um, and just as a brief introduction, I'll state that we have been uh, friends and associates now for well over 20 years. Indeed. And uh, even though I think uh, we know each other well, uh, there's a lot about you that I don't know and I'm looking forward to learning through this, uh, this conversation. Um, I suspect you actually know much of it, but we'll refresh your memory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I uh, uh, would like to start out uh, uh, just by giving a brief overview of the topics that I'm um, planning on covering with you. The mm -hmm. first thing would be your formative years, um, the elements of your childhood and upbringing and education that allowed you to become the man who's accomplished as much as you have. Uh, I'd like to discuss your research with you. I would like to discuss your time on the editorial board and as editor-in-chief of anesthesiology. Okay. Uh, your life as a chair at the University of Iowa, and uh, I'd like to obtain some insight into uh, the Iowa experience um, and the, um, the greatness of that institution and, and what it's contributed to our specialty in medicine in general. And then finally, I'd like to talk to you about the future of anesthesiology. Sounds, okay. sounds fascinating. <laughs> All right, so that's what we're, we're here for. Right. Uh, so why don't we start uh, from the beginning. Um, Give us uh, some insight into your childhood, and um, particularly thinking sure. about the sorts of things that you were that, that made you into what you've become sure. today. Um, uh, well, the usual biographical material. I was born in 1949. I was actually born in Cleveland, Ohio, but I'm told that I lived there for only about six weeks. Um, my dad was there on a job. Um, at which point we returned to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was in fact the family home, um, but only lived there for about four years. My father was a construction worker, although he was a college graduate. There were more opportunities for construction workers in the Depression than there were college graduates, and so he moved into construction. Um, and uh, he had been a lifelong smoker and ended up with COPD, and in those days, of course, the common recommendation of physicians was go west out where the air is dry and it will be good for you. So we picked up shop when I was about four years old and moved to Phoenix, Arizona, um, which was a far cry from Pittsburgh, although I confess I don't have many memories of Pittsburgh. I have vivid memories of Phoenix in the mid-1950s. Um, and I'm fond of telling people, uh, and it's the absolute truth, of seeing people walking down the street with sidearms on. And there were hitching posts in front of a few of the stores down in downtown Phoenix in those days. And it was much closer to the Old West than I think anything you would see out in that part of the country today. Um, and it was a great place to grow up. It was, a, I think, a rather unfettered um, environment. It wasn't like living in a rural community, but we ran around the community in downtown and stuff like proverbial wild Indians, um, kind of by friends down the street and riding on bicycles and going wherever we wanted to go without any sense of fear or concern and just, you know, make sure you're home in time for dinner <laughs> was the usual kind of response. And so um, it was also, I think, um, it was an interesting environment because at that time the school systems, particularly as I moved through elementary school and, uh, and high school, there was a lot of very high-tech 
um, at that time high-tech industry in the Phoenix area. Um, and I got very quickly interested in the space program um, as an observer, of course, uh, in both grade school and in high school. But there was a sense of it being um, real, I think, in Phoenix because there were a number of the very large contractors. Sperry Rand was there and GE building computers and stuff. And I remember as a child uh, taking on field trips to these various places. And so that modern, moving forward, high-tech world felt very real, it felt very exciting. Um, at that time. And so I guess I would say I was a, a child of, of the space program in the 1960s, uh, back when it was, you know, it was considered to be cool to be involved in science. Um, you know, uh, in, in the, you know, in, I remember in high school, um, as always there was a hierarchy of cool kids and less cool kids. Um, and clearly at that time, a little bit like now, the coolest of the kids were the athletes. But the science geeks were like one level below. Um, and it was very acceptable and considered to be really neat to be one of the science crowd. And so I got started doing science and research, oh my heavens, 10 years of age, 11 years of age, something tell, like tell that. Tell us about some of your early experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I started out, you know, being, a, being, a, uh, being interested in the space program, um, we started out with kind of rocketry stuff. I had a very good friend of mine uh, who now lives in Colorado. He and I spent a great deal of time blowing things up um, and stuff today that would unquestionably get children arrested. Um, you could go to the, the, I remember my elementary school library had books you could check out on rocketry, including how to build rocket fuel. Um, how to, you know, how to machine nozzles and all these kind of things. And so we would come up with all kinds of things, making gunpowder myself, you know, at home. I remember my mother, uh, one of my fondest memories was sitting in my kitchen trying to cook up literally a batch of solid rocket fuel made with caramel candy, sulfur, saltpeter on a stove um, with an open flame, and my mother and I are sitting there stirring this pot, trying to make this stuff that we then poured into a piece of capped galvanized pipe that we were going to try and make with a fuse in it and everything else. By today's standards, that would have been called a pipe bomb. Um, it didn't work either. I remember it fizzled. <laughs> but that was the kind of craziness stuff that we did. Um, and it, again, it was nobody thought twice about it. You know, if we blew up something in the backyard, it was, hey, I'll try it again, see what happens. Uh, so we made rockets and we made all kinds of things. It was great fun. And it wasn't, I think the unique feature was not the fact that we did it, but the fact that we did it with the enthusiastic encouragement of our parents. It wasn't a matter of, oh, you can't do that. Oh, this, you know, be careful. There were many be carefuls, but we did these things with the absolute backing of, of parents. I remember when I was, couldn't have been more than about 10 or 11, my father actually, my mother wanted a laundry room built on the house. And so I kind of nudged my dad and he made the laundry room about four times larger than it needed to be and then proceeded to install all the necessary laboratory benches, gas jets, water sources. So I had a completely equipped lab um, in my house. I had to share it with my mom's washer and dryer um, and could sit in there and do just about anything you could do in a basic high school chemistry lab, um, including making the house smell funny and everything else. So it was a great time to, to encourage you know, the enthusiasm for that. I can't, I must have had, in my high school alone, I think in my group there were six, seven, or eight of my colleagues, all of whom went into the sciences in some professional fashion. Medicine, chemistry, engineering, um, another guy went into chemistry, uh, another couple of doctors, all of us were infected with that same enthusiasm of the times um, and followed through with it. 
So, Mike, we're contemporaries, and I'm uh, compelled to ask, uh, what is your uh, m impression of the landing of the man on the moon, and uh, did you stay up all night waiting for them to step out of that capsule? I, I didn't stay up all night because it was actually while I was in college, but I sat and watched it for hours before the event actually occurred. Um, I, what, I, what I remember more was the early Mercury launches. Um, of course, as a kid of the 60s, the Mercury astronauts were the heroes of heroes. Um, but it was kind of the wild and woolly days of rockets because I remember watching things blow up on television, you know, launches. And I remember in Phoenix, because we were several hours ahead of or behind the Cape, um, if they were going to be doing a 7 a.m. launch, you had to be up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And of course, given those days, the holds were interminable. And I remember my mom and I getting up in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning, um, sitting there watching television. Of course, it was Walter Cronkite and these guys doing the announcement, waiting for these events to occur. Um, and yeah, we would stay up for hours, and it was okay to not go to school right on time if it meant watching them launch. And of course, if you did get to school and they hadn't, the teachers had a television set in class, and you would watch it there. So, I'd like to uh, ask you about your uh, your higher education. Um, what was your uh, logic in selecting your your college? Uh, where'd you go to school? Yeah, um, I don't think logic is the right term. Um, I, when I was, I'm going to say I was a junior, sophomore or junior in high school, I wrote a, um, some kind of an essay term on the making of the atomic bomb and in that was the development of the first atomic reactor that was at the University of Chicago um, in December 1942 was the, when it was first went critical. and. For whatever reason, I applied to exactly two schools to go to college. One was the University of Arizona, which was an automatic admission, and the other one was the University of Chicago. Um, and I had been fascinated by the University of Chicago since I had done this paper. I never visited the University of Chicago prior to starting college. I did my interviews in Phoenix. Um, but I read everything I could find, and I sort of said, gee, this is a really interesting place. Um, and I know my mother was kind of reluctant to see me go away, being the last of the kids. Um, and my dad had died by that time, so she was alone. But while there were a few teary moments, it was still a, okay, kid, go get him. Um, and I remember getting on an airplane, which is the first time I'd ever been on an airplane alone in my life, uh, flying to Chicago um, and taking a cab downtown to Hyde Park at the University of Chicago. And I suspect you've heard me say this before, but I remember walking down the streets of Hyde Park through the buildings of the University of Chicago. And this would have been, what, 1967. And we, we make jokes about the term deja vu, but it was, the, it, it was the most extraordinary sense of having been there forever and being in precisely the right place. And it was the proverbial duck and water. I just felt at home at the University of Chicago. I loved it there. And it was a great experience because it was a very liberal school. You know, we marched against the war and protested all sorts of things. But there was great freedom um, to explore ideas. I remember reading something in a biology textbook about mitochondria having DNA. And I said, gee, that's really interesting. And I went over and talked to one of the biology advisors about that. And I, there was a little glimmering of what that represented in terms of could mitochondria be self-replicating and such, and where did they come from? And he said, you need to go talk to Houston Swift. He's the chair of the Department of Biology. And I didn't, I'm a you know, beginning sophomore college kid um, and I ended up working very closely with Dr. Swift in the lab for the next three years, um, graduating to the point where as a junior college student, having my own lab, my own dedicated electron microscope, um, and I remember um, the badge of achievement 
in that laboratory was when you were granted the use of your own diamond knife, which is what was used to cut thin sections um, for electron microscopy. When you were a beginner, you had to use glass knives that you made yourself. But when you finally were accepted into the crew, this, they would come out and give you this diamond knife. It was a used diamond knife, but it was still pretty cool. <laughs> <coughs> and I was, I had the run of the place. I could, had the key, I would go over and work at 3 o'clock in the morning when I got an idea. And that sense of encouraged independence, um, encouraged, rewarded, was something unique, I think, to that environment. And many, many, many of my fellow students had the same experience in different areas around the place. We weren't treated like students. We were treated like colleagues. Um, we were treated like the graduate students. We were treated like the junior faculty without much distinction. And from an educational developmental standpoint, that was extraordinary. I still remember writing my very first publication, which I wrote as an undergraduate, it was published in Journal of Cytochemistry and Histochemistry, I forget. Um, and that was back in the days before word processors. And I think Dr. Swift, I would, I would come up with a version of it and I would handwrite it and I gave it to his secretary and she would type it. And then she would give it to him and it would come back covered with red. And I would make changes and give it back to his secretary and she would retype it. I and mean, we're talking about from the beginning to the end. Um, give it back to him, we would come back all covered with red. And I think we went through seven or eight versions of this before he deemed it ready to submit to the journal. Um, and she dutifully typed every version of it from the beginning to end. Um, but I think maybe that was my first encounter with editorial activities. I also learned the value of being edited. Um, and what it means to have somebody who will take the time to make what you're doing better. Jumping ahead just a little bit, but I, uh, I believe the University of Chicago runs in your family now with your son. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Um, one of my great disappointments was when my son, Anthony, um, did not want to go to the University of Chicago as an undergraduate in spite of my urging. Um, he didn't want to do it. And he came up with this idea that he wanted to go to this small liberal arts college in St. Paul, Minnesota called McAllister. Um, best known Walter Mondale was there and also Kofi Annan graduated from there. And I never had heard of McAllister College. Um, it, he was smarter than I was because it was clearly the right choice for him and he thrived um, at that institution much as I had done at Chicago and for many the same reasons I think they allowed him to do what he wanted to do but not in the sciences. Um, my son had grown up in my lab. You remember Anthony running around the laboratory at all hours of the day and night. He used to like to drape himself over rolling chairs and propel himself across the floor. He also liked to twist all the knobs on all the equipment. Yes uh, he did. <laughs> Yeah, David is, is quite familiar with my son growing up in the laboratory. Um, and, but he didn't want to be a scientist. He became a history person. And I like to take credit for that, too, because I think I took him for his first, first visit to a museum. I don't think he could have been more than six months of age. Um, and he's also grown up in museums. So he loves history. As I'm a history buff. My wife is a history buff. My mother was a history buff. So it runs in the family as well. So lo and behold, he gets done at McAllister College. And the next thing I know is he's at the University of Chicago in a graduate program in history where he is today. I hope he'll get his PhD this year in American history. So yeah, it runs in the family. <laughs> So you come up with a history, uh, I mean, sorry, a, a background in uh, physics and uh, uh, chemistry. What, what swayed you towards medicine? Um, that may be one of the relatively few mercenary decisions I ever made in my life. Um, I remember working as an undergraduate in a basic science laboratory. Um, surrounded by very bright young PhDs. Um, and I remember on at least two occasions, one vividly, one less so, of people who lost their grant funding 
and as a result of losing their grant funding were unemployed and out of work. Um, in other words, they didn't have permanent university appointments. They lived entirely on soft money. And I remember talking to a variety of my fellow students, include, and as well as some of the um, faculty in the lab, and a lot of people said, you know, you really ought to think about going to medical school. And I had worked with faculty in the medical school who were doing basic science. And in fact, pursued an education, pursued medicine, largely because I thought it would let me do science with a safety net under me. Um, and that, you know, if I managed to lose funding, I could at least go back and practice medicine. So, this was the case for so many of us. So, anesthesiology, when did that come into the picture? Um, another one of those vivid memories um, involving an individual. Um, I was, I had started in medicine again thinking that I was going to pursue kind of basic cell biology, biochemistry. I was very much interested in immunology for a while. Um, and I remember I was a junior medical student in my, the very first weeks of my first clinical rotation. I was on internal medicine. Um, and I remember that our service, this was of course back in the days when the residents and the interns and the students did all this stuff alone. And I was a junior student, literally straight out of my non-clinical years. And there was a young man who, um, I think he was 16 years old, was a lifeguard, um, had a near drowning event in Lake Michigan sometime in late June, early July. Um, and he was brought to the emergency room at the University of Chicago Hospitals and he was admitted to our medicine service. Um, and he was admitted to our intensive care unit which consisted of two hospital rooms where they had knocked a wall out between them to make room for four beds. Very crowded and they brought this guy in, terrible respiratory failure, he was acidotic, hypoxemic, all of these things. And I remember my attending physician, who was a famous endocrinologist, um, very much involved in insulin development, insulin synthesis, knowledge and so forth. And I remember, I don't want to sound demeaning because he was truly an excellent physician, but he was clueless. He had absolutely no idea how to care for this young man who was on a ventilator and hemodynamically unstable and so forth. And so at that time at the hospital, anesthesia kind of ran a consult service for critically ill ventilator patients. And the man who was in charge of that was a Dr. Christian Rottenberg. Um, and I remember he and his team showed up in this little ICU and I'm the student standing there and it was magic. I don't, to this day, know what he did. I can guess knowing how to do it. But this kid went from awful to good over a matter of about 45 minutes to an hour based on ventilator management, para I don't know what all he did. Um, and I'm kind of going, looking at this very soft-spoken anesthesiologist going, whoa, hey, this is impressive. Um, Chris Rottenberg also taught me another important rule, and I, this is something I say to resident applicants and students about three days into this, this kid's clinical course, um, he deteriorated. And it was the middle of the night. Um, I don't know whether it was 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., but it was truly the middle of the night. And uh, this kid was really going south. And my resident, who was a bright guy, sort of said, I don't know what to do. And he looked at me, for heavens, I don't know why, and he said, call Dr. Rottenberg. Now, Dr. Rottenberg was not on call that night. So I said, okay. And I went over and I called the operator and says, can you get me Dr. Rottenberg at home? And I got him, he answered me in this very sleepy voice, I still remember it. And I told him what was going on and I to this, I tell everybody, his response was three words, I'll be there. 
and he walked in at about 3.30 in the morning, you know, sort of half-dressed, and fixed everything. Um, and I sort of went, wait a minute, this is something that I'm interested in. And I think that was where it started. And I subsequently had an opportunity to do a very extended anesthesia rotation, working with both Dr. Rottenberg and other people at the University of Chicago, which did not have a strong anesthesia program at that time. But I was allowed as a student again to do, well, I was, I worked as a resident. I mean, basically it was me and a staff guy doing a case and he was covering another room. Um, so I learned how to manage airways and Harry Lowe at that time was doing closed circuit anesthesia and I got to do some of the craziest things. I did 100% nitrous oxide inductions, you know, give them 100% nitrous oxide and wait till they go to sleep and then turn on the oxygen. I did forget to turn on the oxygen once, um, thankfully not catastrophically. But I think again it was the same, it was, it was part of that environmental culture where we were encouraged to do things and we were given a ton of rope. Um, and I don't think I ever hung myself with it, but it was a great opportunity. And I was hooked from that point forward. Never looked back. So the next step would be then in Boston. Yeah. That's another great story um, because at that time I said at the University of Chicago the anesthesia department wasn't very strong um, and I don't think they had a particularly good sense of where I would go for a residency. I knew I wasn't going to stay at Chicago um, and so I had sat down with my advisor, Dr. Rottenberg actually, and he said well you should go to these places um, and I visited a series of programs um, all in the sort of east North uh, actually um, went to Duke um, and interviewed at Duke and so forth. And I remember the last step on my little sojourn was at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I looked at the University of Pennsylvania and I remember interviewing with Harry Woolman. Um, and I'm sitting there in his office and he looks at me and he says, Haven't you applied to Mass General? And I went, no. And he said, you absolutely must apply to Mass General. And I said, okay. And so I called up Mass General. There, was, there were no heiress applications in those days. There was a match, but there was nothing else. And so I um, called him up and I remember flying into Boston on Christmas Day because my interview was on the December 26th meeting Dick Kitts and all those guys. And I think this was, there was no match business for the general. It was, you got a phone call saying, we'll take you. Um, and I will say that Don Benson, who was the chair at the University of Chicago, um, I think was a little disappointed that I wasn't going to stay, but still arranged for me to do my inter internship at the University of Chicago. Mass General did not offer an internship at that time. Um, and so I owe Harry Woolman, I owe Don Benson, and of course Dick Kitts a lot of a lot of gratitude for helping this pathway work out. Chance and chance and serendipity. Massachusetts General Hospital speaks for itself in its history. Um, I, what I'm particularly interested in is uh, at what stage did neuroanesthesia uh, become your your life? Sure. Um, I think again it's a it's a function of role models. Um, I loved the people I got to work with and my staff included people like John Savaris and Hassan Ali and oh boy I can't count the number of world-class individuals Myron Laver, Ed Lowenstein, so forth um, and I loved working with these guys I learned a lot but I remember my first rotations on neurosurgical anesthesia and there was a remarkable crew of people um, uh, there was a young uh, visiting faculty person from Great Britain by the name of Phil Morris. Um, there was a s wonderful man by the name of uh, Panarthur Sundaram. Um, and most importantly, there was a guy by the name of Aaron Gisson. Um, Aaron Gisson was one of, at that time, only five full professors in the Harvard anesthesia system. Um, he had come from Columbia, had done much of the seminal work on succinyl choline um, block um, and he'd done it in the neurosurgical rooms at the Columbia Neurologic Institute 
And I remember, I thought the cases were cool, but Aaron would just sit there in these interminable cases um, and talk science. And we would talk physiology and we would talk um, uh, cerebral vascular physiology. And there was so much of that that permeated that service. Um, and I just ate it up. Um, I thought it was fun. And I guess I had a knack for it. Um, because somehow I came to develop this instinctive understanding for neurosurgical patients. I got along with neurosurgeons for some reason as well, I don't know, um, as I always have ever since. Um, but that was how I, I didn't have any intention of doing neuroanesthesia. Um, I was going to do critical care. My original goal was to go in ahead and do intensive care after my experiences with Chris Rottenberg as an undergraduate. And I just found myself gradually shifting my attentions to neuroanesthesia. And uh, when I was the chief resident, that was back in the days when residencies were only two years old, and the chief residency was a third year. Um, and one of the nice things about being the chief resident at the general was that you got to pick and do any case you wanted any time you wanted to do it. And so um, I could look at the schedule for the next day and I could say, no, there's a sitting position craniotomy down there. I think I'm going to go do it. And you'd call up the resident who was assigned to it and say, hey, I'm going to do this case with you. And the staff would kind of back out of your way because you were kind of junior faculty. So I went down and did neuro cases for fun um, on days when I was not assigned clinically. And I just liked doing it. And so in, by the time I got done with that, I was looking for a neuro fellowship in the lab not clinically, because I thought I had enough clinical experience. Um, and that's, you know, followed that. I looked at, uh, there were only two places in the country at that time where you could do a laboratory-based fellowship under the direction of an anesthesiologist. One was Jack Minchenfelder's lab in Rochester, Minnesota, and the other one was Harvey Shapiro's lab here in San Diego. Um, and I met with both of them. I went out to Rochester. Um, uh, actually didn't come out to San Diego but met with Harvey and actually several people that were fellows in his lab at the time. And the deciding factor was is that the program at the Mayo Clinic required me to spend a very large amount of my time in the operating room. Whereas Harvey's basically said, nope, you get to work in the lab. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in the lab. Um, and so I chose the fellowship that bas basically let me work in the lab and spent essentially two and a half years continuously in a laboratory. During that period of time, I did one day of clinical work, and that was on a, I think I went over and did two ECTs at the VA or something or other. I don't remember what it was. That was my sum contact with clinical medicine for about two and a half years. Absolutely extraordinary opportunity. Because Harvey was a bright guy, but was kind of an absentee landlord. Um, he was mayor of the town of Del Mar at that time and was doing all sorts of things. And so the laboratory basically became my own private sandbox, along with people like John Drummond and Mark Zornow and Mark Scheller, who all kind of came together at that time. And I think we would wave at Harvey about once every two weeks. Um, and we ran the lab ourselves, designed our experiments. And he would critique them and come by and help edit papers and stuff. But it was a great opportunity for a couple of crazy young guys, or four or five crazy young guys, to really learn how to do experiments and manage a research operation largely on our own. We weren't working for Harvey as much as we were working for each other. My knowledge of your ba background, Mike, is uh, that you were principally a laboratory scientist uh, for many years and then uh, became uh, more of a clinical s mm -hmm. scientist in, in, the, in the later years. Um, so the, the first questions I'm going to talk about are the basic science era, uh, which will bridge into Iowa uh, to some extent, and we can come back to Iowa in a moment. But I'm uh, interested in um, particularly your, your, your work was really focused on two areas, as I recall. One was the interaction of volatile anesthetics and or even intravenous anesthetics with pathology in the brain, mm -hmm. um, particularly modeling clinical environments, uh, and also your uh, interest and contributions with respect to fluid therapy and how mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. and that's probably the one I'd like to focus on the most, or maybe I should back off and ask you what you thought would be <coughs> a more significant contribution yeah. and, and, and how you think it plays in today's practice. Well, as a, as a laboratory researcher, I'm sure you've had these experiences. 
the project that I was assigned to when I first arrived in San Diego was looking at barbiturate therapy as a treatment for uh, cerebral injury after cardiac arrest. This was about the time that Peter Safar and the group in Pittsburgh had published their primate study. And I remember Harvey was very skeptical about that. And so my first project was to develop a ventricular fibrillation. Actually, he and Mark Rockoff, uh, who's now uh, on the board, American Board of Anesthesiology, had worked out a model for producing reversible, predictable ventricular fibrillation in cats. And so that was the original experiment that we worked on. Um, and you know, this was a 24-hour-a-day cat ICU with us as the nurses taking care of these sick animals. Um, and I don't quite remember, my interest in cerebral blood flow came around backwards. Harvey had asked me to write a review article. You know, he'd been asked to write a review article, so he asked me to write it, um, which, by the way, is a great way to get young people started, um, on measurement of cerebral blood flow. And I knew nothing about the measurement of cerebral blood flow. And so I researched and read and read and researched and read and read and so forth. Um, and got this book chapter, in effect, uh, published. And we then discovered that within the laboratory in this storage area, there was a unit that would have allowed us to do radioactive xenon washout external counting, cerebral blood flow measurements. And I remember, I think it was John Drummond and myself looked at that and said, oh, this is cool we got to do this. Um, and so we figured out how actually a young man named Siyoshi Mayakawa from Japan actually came at that time and showed us how to cannulate these little tiny arteries in cats. And we had this sort of single external detector device set up and we started measuring cerebral blood flow in cats by radioactive xenon. Um, and I remember that what, one of the things that was fascinating about that is, is that if you've done those kind of physiology measurements, you see it right in front of you. It's like an anesthesiologist in the operating room where you watch the blood pressure and the heart rate change. You know, you could hear the Geiger counter clicking and you could watch it drawing the washout curve on a sheet of paper. And you just look at it and say, flows up, flows down. Um, there was this immediate sense of feedback. And so that's where we started working on volatile agents, volatile anesthetics. Um, more as this, it had Harvey lab, that was not the focus of the lab. Um, and I think I had been out of my fellowship for a while, and I've been in the operating room, and at that time there was a lot of discussion about crystalloids and colloids and brain swelling and things like that. And I remember there was a there was a, it was a detail man company rep for somebody, that, the people that made henna starch. Um, and I had gotten talking to him uh, for some reason, and he said, you know, you guys got to do a project looking at this. You know, does it make a difference whether you give a colloid, meaning henna starch, um, or a crystalloid? And I, we got some original funding from the people that made henna starch to start looking at fluids. Um, and it was, I believe, Mark Zornow that did some of the earliest experiments, starting to recognize that it wasn't crystalloids and colloids. Colloid oncotic pressure didn't do anything, or not much. Um, and the importance of osmolality, which the old guard physiologist would have looked at you and said, yeah, we knew. But the clinical world hadn't quite figured that out. And so that was where that all came from. Many publications and a great change in practice resulted from that. I like to think so. I think you know we largely put a put an end to this concept that somehow, as you can make people's brains swell up by giving them fluids. And you know I grew up with the idea that you always had to keep them dry. And we would get patients that had been in the hospital for a week or two coming to the operating room for a brain tumor, who were severely dehydrated. I mean, they were hypovolemic dehydrated to the point where putting them asleep and doing an anesthetic was often a rather hair-raising experience because you would give them the pentothal or what happened and the bottom would fall out of their pressure. And the idea that that was not a necessary component of measuring these patients was 
I think something that is good. Um, we are about to we are about to uh, go into the Iowa years, but I have skipped over an important part of <laughs> your life, uh, Oops. <laughs> which is uh, another member of the family, and that would be uh, Mrs. Linda Todd. Yep. Um, uh, tell us tell us about how how she came into your life and and the impact on on your career and. It's I'm never aware of how many of these stories are, in retrospect, actually kind of humorous and funny. Um, but they are, and meeting my wife is another one. Um, I was, I think I was a junior medical student or early in my, maybe it was my sophomore year, I don't remember, um, at Chicago. And um, my mother was in town. It was on. It was around my birthday, and my mother was in town, and so we had this get together. My mother and two good friends of mine, myself, and we went to my favorite Greek restaurant, restaurant in Chicago, the Parthenon, where I to this day go every time I'm in Chicago. And my two friends invited along this other woman, who turned out to be Linda. So I met my wife on a blind date in a Greek restaurant on my birthday with my mother present. Um, and we've been together ever since. Um, and so she grew up in Chicago. She actually grew up in Highland Park and then out in Park Ridge. Um, spent all of her years, uh, went to school uh, in a couple of places, including about a year and a half. She actually was working on a graduate degree in history at the University of Wisconsin for a while, didn't finish it came back and I met her when she was a respiratory therapist. Um, and so, and then off to Boston, off to California, and then of course Anthony came along when we lived in California. Um, I think which played a major role in the change to the Iowa years. Um, because we were looking at a little three-year-old growing up in San Diego at a time when the public school system was a disaster due to the aftermath of Proposition 13. And my wife was from the Midwest and I'd spent nine years in Chicago and we both looked at each other and said, we're not staying in San Diego. Started looking around and... Well, Mike, I'm just uh, uh, wanting to put a little perspective on this because I was a faculty member at the University of Iowa um, back in, I believe, 1985-86. Um, and uh, you visited us as a, you came as a visiting professor, um, which was just a routine visit, and uh, much to our uh, um, total surprise, not only did you come as a visiting professor, but you were looking for a job. Yep. Oh yes, I, I, I didn't know I was looking for a job at Iowa, but I knew we weren't going to stay in San Diego. And I had been very much attracted to the Midwest. I had actually gone up and looked at Wisconsin. Um, been to Milwaukee, looked at the University of Chicago, because both my wife and I had pretty well said, no, nope, we're not staying here. Uh, I tried to get me back to Mass General. That didn't look like a good opportunity. And of course, as you know, Dr. Tinker was a great salesman. Yes. And the next thing I know is we're moving to Iowa. So um, at Iowa, uh, developed a, long, a laboratory. Uh, I should mention also that one of the major attractions of moving to the University of Iowa was having the opportunity of working with this bright young man <laughs> who was there ahead of me, but it, you know... We I, needed serious mentoring. Yeah, uh, but it was also an opportunity to have someone with like-minded enthusiasm and interest, and that's so important in the success of this business. We touched on your, your basic science work, um, which you've also continued to this day, but uh, you also developed a strong interest in clinical research. Um, give us some insight into that, and I'm particularly interested yeah. in the roots of that that brought us to the IHAS study. Right. I, I think that may be as much your fault as anybody's. Um, David and I shared a laboratory for many years, literally had desks right next to each other. It was a beautiful laboratory. Um, and both of us were working on various aspects of basic science. David in the area of cerebral ischemia, myself in the area of largely fluid cerebral vascular physiology and stuff. Both of us were on the lecture circuit. And I remember talking about issues of clinical medicine, clinical management and stuff, and over and over and over again, 
people would come up, and I remember David saying the same thing, having people come up and say, what can I do to protect the brain of my patients? And we're doing animal studies and we're looking at nitrous oxide and this drug and that drug and so forth. But the answer was, we don't know. I can tell you what works in a rat, but I haven't got a clue of what goes on in human beings. And I remember we sat there, you know, it was one of the nice things about sharing a, a common space with somebody with a like mind is we would just sit and talk um, for long periods of time. And it started the, well, gee, you know, how would you go out, go about figuring out whether something that we're doing protects the brain in patients that mean something to us as neurosurgical anesthesiologists? Um, and that percolated for, I mean, we had, those discussions went on for ages. Um, and I don't think either one of us had any particular expertise in clinical research. We were clinicians, we were good clinical anesthesiologists. Um, and I think one of the major factors was when David um, walked down the hallway one day and spoke to a man by the name of Jim Torner, who you'd known from before, who, was head, who subsequently became head of epidemiology as a clinical trial epidemiologist. And clinical trials were a reality to Jim. Um, to us, they were kind of esoteric. And from that point forward, we started talking more and more and more about how to turn this concept of what we were doing in the laboratory into a human experiment, which was eventually what led to the large IHAS trial. So I'll provide my opinion here that I think IHAS stands as uh, probably the best conducted uh, human study in certainly neuroanesthesia and quite possibly anesthesia as a specialty. Um, I'm not here to de debate that, but I am here to ask what lessons did you learn from IHAST and how would they be of value to those lessons to the specialty as a whole? Maybe just tell us just briefly yeah. what this, the IHAST was. IHAST, the, the, the letters stand for Intraoperative Hypothermia for Aneurysm Surgery Trial. It was a large multi-center randomized clinical trial. It involved 30 hospitals around the world. We had people in Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, Germany, Austria, Great Britain. There were about 600 participating anesthesiologists, neurosurgeons, and research techs. It involved a thousand patients. It was funded by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and uh, I'm, I am proud as a proud papa on that project because I think we did good. And I don't say I did good, we did good because it involved the input of a huge number of right people, including yourself. Um, without that input, it would never have flown. It was, it was the, you know, the, the cosmic tumblers came together in the right way to make that happen. Well, what have I learned? I've learned that people, when they cooperate and work together, can do really amazing things. Um, I've also learned that that coming together requires a leader. It doesn't happen spontaneously. Someone has to take charge of it. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who really want to do things. Nobody does a big project like that because they make money. This wasn't a drug company trial. This was funded by the federal government, which means they were cheap, even if the total bill was about $10 million. Um, they did it because they really wanted to be part of something that they perceived as valuable. And I think if you can identify projects like that, there's a, a huge community of people in anesthesia, other places in medicine, neurosurgery, who will enthusiastically participate and do an incredibly good job. So that's number one. Number two, I learned um, the truth of Hal Adams' rule of thirds. Um, the rule of thirds consists of whenever you're doing a clinical project, a third of the participating centers will do a great job, a third of them will require work, and a third of them will drive you nuts. Um, and in fact, a third of our centers had drove us nuts, and we actually had to throw some friends out. Hal Adams always said, when you do a large clinical trial, you're going to lose some friends. Uh, I don't think I lost any friends, but there were a number of people that didn't do well. Simultaneous with that, um, mm -hmm. actually, probably 
coincident with that, it was uh, your um, um, role on the editorial board of anesthesiology. Um, mm -hmm. I remember a picture of the editorial board uh, that you held on the wall of your office with great pride. I and still have it on the wall of my <laughs> office. <laughs> Do you really? And, uh, and um, s uh, uh, your mentor, uh, one of your mentors was Larry Saban, mm -hmm. uh, who was the editor-in-chief, and uh, eventually it became you, the editor-in-chief of anesthesiology. Correct. And within that, uh, that uh, topic, I have a couple of questions. I, I specifically, I'd like to know how uh, being the editor-in-chief of anesthesiology changed you. And I'd like to know how you changed uh, anesthesiology. That's a tough one. Um, I think I learned to be a, being both the editor in chief of anesthesiology and the principal investigator at IHAST, which had a lot of overlap, I learned a lot more about dealing with people um, and uh, working with people, trying to get people to, I guess in a sense, do what you wanted them to do. I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative fashion, but leadership is sometimes following, sometimes pushing, sometimes cajoling. Um, and I think one of the things that I really learned as the editor-in-chief of anesthesiology particularly working with the editorial board, which is made up of some of the best and brightest people in our specialty, bar none, was that you couldn't tell them what to do because they'd just look at you and say, go away. You had to convince them what was the right thing to do, and that put a burden on me that I really hadn't, I think I was a, a, a tad on the overbearing, tell people what to do stage, and I had to learn to be much smarter I had to learn how to draw out their best ideas and coordinate them with what I thought needed to be done. Learning to work with that group of individuals, the editors of the editor, editorial board of anesthesiology, was by itself one of the greatest learning experiences of my life. Um, they taught me, I think, as much as I could possibly have done for them. Many of them were senior to me. Um, I remember several of them taking me over and saying, hey, you, kid. Um, Gary Strickarts in particular was very good about that sort of thing and I came to recognize him as a source of wisdom um, and I think that's what I got out of it. I learned how to work closer with, I guess I would say working more closely with a large number of equals um, and I think it was absolutely critical. I think it paid off in terms of making IHAST a better study because I learned how to deal with people. Um, what did I do to anesthesiology? I don't know. Um, I guess from an objective standpoint, I got to shepherd it through the transition into the electronic era. Um, I actually wrote the HTML code for the first website that anesthesiology had, did it myself on my computer. It was very bad. Um, you'd never know it today. Um, we were the first of the anesthesia journals to go online. Um, and we were the first of the anesthesia journals to develop electronic submission procedures and so on and so forth. So I think uh, if you want to point to some objective something, I think that would be the one thing I did. I think I'm happiest, however, about the fact that we, we meaning myself and the board, never lost sight of what we, th what I believe to this day is the thing that makes anesthesiology unique, and that is, is the highest quality science that the journal can get its hands on and publish and if various individuals out there don't like it because it's too esoteric or it's not relevant to our practice, my response is tough luck. I don't mean that in a derogatory fashion, but I believe very strongly that if our journals do not publish the best science being done by our people, then we invite obsolescence. If our journals are publishing nothing but easy to digest continuing medical education material, then we're going to get left in the dust by the other medical professions. And I think anesthesiology to this day um, continues, has never lost that vision of what it is supposed to do. And I think we did a very good job of strengthening that vision. 
Another change that occurred during your, your tenure as chief, editor-in-chief of anesthesiology um, pertained to the management of manuscripts uh, and historically had been basically a one-man job uh, as editor-in-chief reading and deciding <laughs> on every manuscript, but you carried that burden for many years, but later in the term shifted it so that the editorial board became more uh, responsible for that process. Can you explain that sure. change? Sure. Um, Historically, you're right. The editor-in-chief reviewed and edited and made the decision on every single manuscript that came across um, his desk. Um, and that was why the editor-in-chief job was largely a full-time job. It had evolved from uh, a small journal under Jack Minchenfelder. I think Jack would handle about four or five hundred manuscripts a year. And by the time I took over, we were handling twelve to fifteen hundred manuscripts a year. I'm fond of saying that I have personally reviewed and edited over 20,000 manuscripts. But in reality, um, there was no possible way that I think that process could continue. Number one, I was also looking at becoming a department chair, um, and I couldn't keep up with that workload. More importantly, as the, as the volume of manuscripts grew, even a full-time editor-in-chief simply could not keep up with that. And as the science also began to be get more and more and more sophisticated. You know, I'm not a molecular biologist. I'm not a geneticist. Um, I had to rely more and more and more on the expertise of other members of the board. And at some point along the line, it became apparent that why shouldn't they be making the decisions? Why shouldn't we decentralize some of this stuff? And so we started doing that, um, I think, probably about three years before the end of my tenure. And the nice thing about it is the editors simply loved it. They really, or most of them, seriously enjoyed the transition from being a, an article reviewer to a decision maker. And I think it has succeeded beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I would like to make a comment. There's one other thing that I'm pleased with. Uh, with respect to the journal, and that is, is it was it was the internationalization of the editorial board and the editorial process. Prior to my taking over as the editor in chief, there were no non-American members of the editorial board. Um, in spite of the fact that greater than half of the manuscripts that were published in the journal were coming from outside the United States. And I don't know what fraction of the editorial board now are international, but it's probably close to 50%. Mm -hmm. And I think it has made a much better journal. Well, congratulations on all of that, of course. Um, and it is stronger, we know, uh, because of your, 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 your leadership. Um, Thank you. And uh, you've sown the seeds for even further growth. Uh, I uh, want you to put your imagination hat on for a moment here and just give us some thoughts about what you believe the future of medical publishing is. There's a, there's a, a very different sort of medium yeah. approaching and, and, and is this the, do you view this as likely to persist as the best way to report new information, disseminate it, um, educate, yeah. or do you think that this is something that is going to change? Oh, I think it's going to change and it's going to change even more than it has recently. I think, I really do believe that the paper journal will disappear. I think the economics of printing and mailing, putting ink on paper are becoming, will we'll, we'll kill it. Moreover, I think journal articles do have a certain ephemeral characteristic to them. None of us like to admit that, but they do. And so I think that the paper journal will disappear. I think a medical journal will be something you will read on your Kindle or your iPad um, or some other equivalent electronic device or your desktop computer. Um, I think the real question is not the format. I think the real question will have to do with things such as the peer review process um, and the ability of people to publish stuff in a somewhat different format. We know that the physics world many, many years ago created these open peer review systems where you could put a manuscript into a electronic site and essentially anybody could come in and throw rocks at it um, before it was considered to be final. It was a very open process. Um, I think that I don't see that happening in medicine because in the physics world everybody who was critiquing your paper was a 
fully trained physicist. Um, there's a big difference between critiquing a piece of physiology by a clinician and so forth. But I think that the nature of the peer review system in some way will change. I think we may make it more open. I do hope that we do not abandon it. I am a strong believer that peer review is, is the single thing that makes the difference between what anesthesiology, ANA, and other major journals do and some of the other junk that's out there. You need that peer review. Just like I needed my Houston Swift to write red marks all over my first manuscript, the peer review process you know, is bad. Everybody says it's terrible, but it's the best we got. I can't see a better way of ensuring high quality products than a peer review process. Um, people love to throw rocks at it. We see many examples of things that, in which the peer review process fails. We miss things, but haven't seen a better one. And so the format of publishing will change. Um, I think that there may be alterations in the peer review process. It may get broader, but I do sincerely hope that the peer review process does not get shoved aside because I think that would be very, very bad for medical science and science in general. Mike, I'd like to ask you, um, in addition to the change to the electronic format and the, uh, the expanded role of the editorial board in the decision-making process, uh, uh, what other changes in the journal did you make that, that you believe were important and that you're satisfied with? Oh, I think probably two. Um, one was the introduction of what we call the CCCs, which were these brief clinically focused review articles. That was an idea that came from Alex Evers. Um, and I think that has continued as very high quality articles. Um, towards the tail end of my uh, tenure was also when we began first publishing um, articles in which we gave CME credit. Um, that was a very, I think that was a nice joint project between the journal, the editorial board, and the ASA CME operation. And so, as you know now, there are articles in anesthesiology every month that provide CME credit. Um, and actually, they're very good articles. Um, there's a new section now that Jim has started on uh, broader educational issues, but that post-dated my tenure. So, Mike, you're now the, uh, the head of the Department of Anesthesia at the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. Uh, from my um, 14 years there and my later years now, I'm aware of the great contributions of that department to the specialty of anesthesiology. Um, it's basically been a crucible of leaders of the specialty. Um, I'd like to have your reflection on um, the state of the department now and uh, in particular what is it about the University of Iowa and the Department of Anesthesia at the University of Iowa that is that is provided this sort of um, environment of, of, of leadership in the specialty? That's a difficult question because it's, it's very personal, I guess, in a sense. Um, I think the department has in very good shape. I think, I think you were well aware of what it looked like when John Tinker was there. Um, when people like you, myself, Brad Heinemann, Tim Brennan all arrived, it was superb. Went through an unfortunate interim period when it deteriorated badly. Um, and I think uh, the thing that I'm probably proudest of is the fact that we've done a wonderful job over the last five years of kind of getting us back where we belong. We're not there yet, but we're headed in the right direction. Um, that's always a matter of good, bright people and an environment in which they're encouraged to succeed. Why? What's unique about Iowa? It's easier for me to, to answer that question viewing it from the perspective of being in other institutions and coming to the University of Iowa and seeing a practice and an intellectual environment that's different. Number one, Iowa is an institution without walls. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean that people can work across departmental boundaries with no obstacles whatsoever. Just like you were able to walk down the hallway and corner Jim Torner in public health, I can walk down the corner and grab my chair of neurosurgery and sit down and cook up a project or talk to someone in neurology or my cardiac surgeon's 
my cardiac anesthesiologist can go down and work in the cardiology echo laboratory. And that's not true in many other institutions. In many institutions, it's very difficult to collaborate without artificial obstacles. Um, Iowa has no such obstacles. Um, and I think that's a unique reason for its success. People work together across departmental lines and across college lines. I mean, in recent years, we've been working with the individuals in the College of Education across the river and the bioengineering divisions and stuff. Um, our most recent grant we just got working at cervical spine stuff is a collaborative project with bioengineering um, at Colorado State, um, who used to be at Iowa. And so um, that's unique. Number two is, is that I think there is, it's that Midwestern culture of civility, um, I think. I can't, we get tough-nosed and stuff, but I think people are considerate. I think they are, in general, caring and supportive. Um, I see, for example, in the department now, as well as my tenure, much more of a sense of cohesiveness and community. I hesitate to use the word family, much more so than I've seen in other institutions. And I think that's part and parcel of the culture of the Midwest. Um, I think we, you know, we have our tug of war with our surgeons and stuff, but we work much more closely in a much less contentious fashion with surgeons than I've seen in other institutions. Um, with rare exception in previous lives, I worked with surgeons. Many surgeons now are people that I call friends. And I have a hard time imagining that in other places that I've worked. And yet people truly are friends. I mean, we go out after work and do things. Um, and I can sit in the hallway and people come up to my office and we drink coffee and just yak. That's something that's inherently Iowa, I think. Um, as a leader, um, how do you pick the best and brightest? What do you see that, you know, in a young person that, that causes you to want to invest in them? Oh, I, I, I don't think you pick them. I think they pick you. Um, it's a good example of, you know, when those people, uh, it, when you have a group of individuals, those people just light up. I mean, it's suddenly there's this bright glowing halo. They don't know they've got it. But if you've been in the business for a while, you see it. They identify themselves by virtue of their intelligence, their effort, their commitment. And it's not too hard after a period of time to recognize who those individuals are. They don't all pan out. Um, some of them don't go forward, but uh, it's a relatively small number of people. I, I found it very easy not to identify them. I mean, they're easy to do. It's to support them. And all you can do is to try and do... I guess what I would say was done for me, and that's to give them opportunity, give them rope. Our job as a department chair or our job as mentors is not so much to tell them what to do, but to break down the obstacles that get in their way so that they can do their job. Um, I think the hardest part in the world is actually getting those kind of people into our specialty. Um, convincing the best and the brightest of the medical students that this is a place where they can thrive, that this is a specialty where they can thrive. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge. And I think that's been that way for a long time. I think it's getting better, by the way. A question that uh, um, pervades, I, th I think, all of medicine right now, um, but in particular anesthesiology, is the role of the physician scientist. Um, as the clinical demands are great and probably more so the technology of science is increasing and requires mm -hmm. true extensive training. What do you view as the future role for the physician scientist and in particular in the world of anesthesiology? I think there will, I hope, always be strong physician scientists. Um, people who in fact devote a very large portion of their time to doing research. Um, I would say something that is probably not 
mainstream. But I think I don't think that's the future. I don't think that's what we need for the future of our business. Um, creating individuals with large research operations and NIH grant is absolutely critical. I think what we're faced with is to try and gain more physician investigators out of the clinicians that represent the bulk of our project. People that'll never get an NIH grant, but who have good ideas, but simply need to be guided and assisted in turning those ideas into products. I turned to, I don't remember who I was talking to, Steve Schaefer or someone within the last few days, and I said, you know, I think I'd rather see a hundred bright clinical anesthesiologists publish a paper on something meaningful to our specialty than to see one physician scientist get a $5 million NIH grant. Um, I think we as a broad specialty would benefit in this competitive world of other specialties by raising the productivity, the intellectual activity, the participation by clinicians in the intellectual world of anesthesia science. Um, I think that would be more valuable to us than more NIH funded individuals. And by the way, we'll get more NIH funded individuals if we succeed in that mission. Um, so that's how I would, that's one of the things that I think is a goal for me is to see if there's any way to take, and you and I have met many of those individuals. They're bright young individuals. For whatever reason, they don't have time to go off and spend two and a half years in the laboratory or a year in Sweden and what have you. Um, they're going to be primarily clinician anesthesiologists. But that doesn't mean that they can't contribute. That doesn't mean that they can't have good ideas. That doesn't mean that they can't carry out high quality research activities. Um, they just need our help to do it. And I would like to see us encourage those kind of physician scientists because I think that's what they really are. Um, I really would like to see us spend more time trying to encourage that. Mike, thank you very much. I've enjoyed this immensely. And I just have one uh, crazy question for you. OK. Um, and I think the younger people might be interested in this. As you know, there is uh, a constant battle to preserve the integrity of the specialty of anesthesiology, mm -hmm. um, pain, critical care, even the act of anesthesia itself. Uh, many different constituencies are are, are at our doors looking for our turf. Absolutely. Um, and it's also become extremely s safer uh, than it had been and much more technologically driven. Um, do you think there will be an anesthesiologist 50 years from now? Absolutely. But I think it will be a very different specialty than today and what we grew up with. Um, I tell this to um, resident applicants. I said, if you think that you are going to spend the rest of your career doing routine anesthesia on healthy individuals, then I have a bridge to sell you in Bolivia. Because that can be done by people with less experience than yours for a lot less money. Um, I know politically it's incorrect to suggest that that can be done by CRNAs, but the reality is they're extremely good at that. I, in fact, tell CRNAs they're overpaid and overtrained for a lot of that stuff and that they need to be looking over their shoulders at things like anesthesia assistance. Because we, we as anesthesiologists have made it easier and safer to do anesthesia. It's the inevitable byproduct of our own actions um, in creating safer tools, safer, better monitors, smarter monitors, better drugs, drugs with better therapeutic margins. The result is, is that people can do, you know, back when I started and you started, you know, with ether and I've done ether anesthesia and I'm sure that uh, others have done more than that. It was, it was a very, the art of anesthesia was a, was a bigger part of the job. I can teach somebody to do a safe anesthetic now without the years of experience. So I think the role of the anesthesiologist is going to be morphing. I think it's going to focus on 
the broader world of medicine, the sicker patient, the more complex procedures, the care of patients outside the operating room, the management of things other than the routine performance of an anesthetic on a straightforward case. Um, I'm not so much worried about the turf wars, but I will say that I don't believe that you can win those by legislating. I don't think you can win them by building walls around yourself as a specialty. Um, if we're going to survive as a specialty, we will have to earn our own survival. And that means that we will have to make it evident to all of the other physicians with whom we work that we offer something that someone else can't offer. And that means showing up at 3 o'clock in the morning like Christian Rottenberg did to take care of a critically ill teenager. Uh, we have to be willing to be physicians. Um, we have to be willing to go the extra mile to take care of the sickest of patients. Um, we can't be looking to get out the door at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because we only want to work an eight-hour day. Um, and I think, as I said, we have to earn our position within the world of medicine. And we've done it. We've earned our position, but it's not something that you earn in perpetuity. You've got to keep re-earning it. And I think that we as a specialty, if we're going to survive for the 50 years, we're going to have to earn our way into the future. And that's going to involve some changes in the way we do things. What's a well, good last question? Mike, we're a good friend, but I want to shake the hand of a great <laughs> anesthesiologist. <laughs> Thank you for your wisdom and uh, your contributions, um, which aren't, we, I know you're not done yet, um, but uh, it's been so much and uh, so many have, have benefited from your being one of us. And, um, well, thank you very much, and I look forward to the day when I can sit in that chair and interview you sitting in this chair. <laughs> and just so you know, I claim the right to do that. So this concludes our um, interview with Dr. Michael Todd. Um, I would like to thank the Wood Library Museum for this opportunity to immortalize uh, his contributions uh, from a living history perspective and the in particular the Living History Committee of the Wood Library Museum, including Dr. Bradley Smith and Dr. Marcel Willock.